Good evening, everybody. I'm Scott Merrick, a senior transportation planner with Ramsey County Public Works. This is the Victoria Street Trail Study, um, our second open house, and we're just going to wait another minute or two and then we'll get started. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started in just one minute. Thank you. All right, welcome again, everybody. I'm Scott Merrick, a senior transportation planner with Ramsey County Public Works. This is the Victoria Street Roadway and Trail Design Study. Next slide, please. Um, this study, just as a recap for those that were not connected last fall, is uh, looking at trail design concepts along Victoria Street um, in the cities of Roseville and Shoreview. The first meeting that we had last fall went over existing conditions along the corridor. And tonight we are going to discuss trail design concepts that have been developed on the east and the west sides of Victoria Street. Uh, we have with us this evening uh, a number of individuals that are involved with the project. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Mark Culver, uh, City Engineer and Public Works Director with the City of Roseville. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, as Scott said, I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Roseville. I've been with uh, Roseville since uh, 2014, and I can say that almost since my first year at Roseville, um, this corridor, Victoria Street, has been on the radar screen. Um, and I know that there's some frustration in Roseville, I'm sure there is in Shoreview as well as to um, why there isn't a trail there today. And um, I just wanted to say from Roseville's perspective that this is a, um, a priority. Uh, we're very grateful that the county has taken on this corridor study and we're, we're excited to be a partner in this. And we're very um, eager to uh, all eventually implement uh, the findings of this study. Um, there's still a lot of hurdles in that regard as far as funding and the set and the other, um, but, but we're ready to be an active partner in that. And I hope everybody, as they maybe see some of the materials and go through this process, understand the complexity of, of actually putting something um, along this corridor. But uh, again, we thank you for you taking your time here and just wanted you to know that, uh, you know, this is a very important um, pro future project for the city of Roseville. Thanks, Mark, and we appreciate the partnership. And uh, another uh, significant partner on this project is Tom Wesselowski, the city engineer for the city of Shoreview. Uh, yeah, thank you, Scott. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, uh, just um, go along with what, what Mark stated. Uh, this has been an important corridor. Uh, the city has kind of looked at on and off uh, the last number of years. And, you know, same thing, it's, it's, it's a pretty complicated corridor and, and we knew we'd need the, the county as, as a partner to, to get anything done. And, 
we've even had you know some preliminary conversations with with Roseville over the last uh, number of years you know concerning this corridor and the potential for for some improvements so uh, so yes, we're also excited that uh, the county has taken the initiative to go ahead and complete this study. And uh, again, we look forward to um, you know working through this process and, and being an active partner and uh, working toward getting a solution here to to figure something out. And appreciate everyone taking their time to to meet with us tonight. And, and hopefully, we can answer your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And then just real quickly, some other. Uh staff and representatives that have been involved with the project, Rick, uh, Rich Strawman and Jean Jarrington from Ramsey County Active Living. We also have Scott Yonke from Ramsey County Parks and Jay Martin, a uh, citizen representative from the city of Shoreview that's on our technical advisory committee. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, a couple things uh, just to keep in mind and we also do have potentially have commissioner Nicole Fretham uh, joining us at some point this evening. Uh, Commissioner Mary Jo McGuire sends her regrets. She's not able to be here. Um, but just, uh, just so you all know that there is a Q&A function, I believe somewhere on your screen. So we would encourage you to just chat in those questions um, at any point during the presentation. And then we will field those at the end of the presentation. Uh, if we run out of time for whatever reason and don't get to all the questions, we will make sure to answer the questions and all the questions will be, and the answers will be posted on the project website, uh, as well as a video um, re recording of this meeting and a PowerPoint presentation of the meeting. So lots of ways to stay in touch and be, be involved. And as I'm just wrapping up here now, I do see Con uh, Commissioner Fretham has joined us. Um, good evening, Commissioner. Would you like to um, say um, hi to the uh, attendees? Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad you are here tonight. First, I just need to take a moment for those of you who are uh, my neighbors and live close to Victoria Street. We had um, a, a scary night the other night, and I just want to acknowledge that um, for all of us that are here gathered today. And I know details are still coming out about the incident. And um, if, like me, you were close enough to hear gunshots, that's not something we're used to in our community. And I just want to say that I am um, uh, with you, and I, I hope you're taking time to heal on that. Uh, but I am glad to be here tonight to talk about this Victoria Street project and the opportunity to improve the safety for our, our entire community, those of us who live uh, close to or along Victoria who travel that route often. We know how difficult it is uh, to be safe on that street if you're walking or biking. Um, and even sometimes when you're driving, because we know that as we're driving up and down that street, we might be uh, coming around the corner to see someone like biking or walking or to see the, the neighborhood turkeys or deer. And so we don't want to blast through it the way that some folks do. Um, and so I'm really, really excited about these designs. And actually my daughter might come make comments later because she was excited that, oh, it might be safe for me to go you know, bike to Central Park or, or whatnot. And because I won't let her do that right now. Uh, so thank you for being here. Please share your feedback. This is something that's <laughs> Not this one, this one's a little too young to bike to Central Park, but someday. Uh, but uh, we are excited about this um, and we're glad you're here to join us today to talk about future, future improvements in our community. So thank you all. Thank you for joining us tonight, uh, Commissioner Fretham. We really appreciate your support on this project. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mary Goot and our consultant team to go through the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so yes, I'm gonna just do a quick introduction of uh, the consultant team. So I, I'm, my name is Mary Goot. I'm the project manager, uh, transportation planner and project manager for this, um, this study. I'm joined tonight by two other WSB staff. We've got um, Matt Greenslit, who will, um, Tell us more about uh, some of the concepts we're taking a little bit closer look at a little later in the presentation. And we also have Austin Hopp, who's a planner as well, and helping out with the study and um, running sort of the behind the scenes stuff tonight. And we'll um, chime in if needed as well on some of the technical work he's been doing. And then we have 
a partner on our team, Antonio Roselle with a community design group, and he will be also talking about concepts. With that, I'll jump in and quickly go over the agenda. We've done our introductions. We'll quickly do a, an overview of corridor characteristics, uh, summarize what we heard at uh, our first set of open houses back this past fall, discuss what we've been doing since that first open house, including uh, some of the designs that we've considered, both the facility type and also um, how this might get implemented as a, you know, the phasing of the implementation. We'll look at some cross sections and screening and then um, plan view concepts and then discuss next steps. So uh, just quickly over existing conditions, this is information shared at the first open house, but just to quickly refresh our memories and um, center us all in, into the same spot. So we're looking at a 1.8 mile long corridor of Victoria Street, and that extends from County Road C in the south up to Cannon Avenue. And of course, we've mentioned that is um, includes portions of both Roseville and Shoreview. Uh, roughly just under 5,000 to uh, 6,200 vehicles a day use this road. So it's, it's a fairly well used road. It's um, currently a two lane, two way street. Uh, with some paved shoulders and a rural cross section, meaning that it has some ditches rather than um, curb and gutter for the majority of the corridor. Just a small portion of this, um, this road, this corridor has sidewalks just at the far south end um, intersecting with County Road C. And then um, aside from that, there are some striped shoulders that uh, some bikers do and walkers do choose to use. Okay, getting to that first round of open houses we had uh, in this past fall, we had an in-person open house in October and then an, an online open house like we're doing tonight in November of 2021. Just generally um, high level comments, general uh, summary of those, there was uh, general support for Victoria Street improvements. Um, that was the overwhelming um, sentiment expressed. There were some um, folks who had some concerns or um, weren't, uh, sure that this project needed to happen. But for those uh, expressing support for Victoria, we heard um, need to address some of those uh, geometric is issues like some you know, curves, there are some curves out there, um, hills, shoulder widths varies, that's making it maybe um, a little bit challenging for bikers to, to use those. Um, other safety issues are uh, maybe more um, things in driver control speeding vehicles was one thing mentioned very frequently. Uh, people crashing into mailboxes, onto lawns, um, issues with deer. Um, we, didn't, we didn't hear turkeys last time, but we can add that to our list. Um, also wanted, just people wanted improved neighborhood connectivity to um, between their homes and parks, trails, ball fields, schools, and just overall wanted a safe, comfortable um, walking and biking environment on Victoria. Uh, since the open house, um, I mentioned that we have developed a variety of typical cross sections that include roadway, pedestrian and bicycle elements. Um, and we've screened those cross sections. We'll go over this tonight and then developed plan views of two of those concepts. Some of the things that we considered as we were developing cross sections um, were needing to be consistent with Ramsey County's policy to provide access for all ages and all abilities. We also determined that uh, a trail or a facility for bicyclists and pedestrians needed to provide a low level of traffic stress. So that's it's some, a little bit of a technical term that essentially means it should be suitable for unsupervised kids, like that, you know, old enough unsupervised kids to um, safely use. And then, uh, so that being said, the recommendation that we came up with early on was to have a shared use path or a side path with a recommended width of 10 feet, but um, eight feet would also be acceptable. Um, phased, uh, so a Victoria Street vision and a phased approach. So we're gonna look at some concepts that have uh, some, uh, some uh, something on both the east and the west side. Uh, of Victoria Street. However, we want to preface that before we get into this, we want to preface that by saying that currently the county does not have plans to do a full reconstruction of Victoria Street, nor do they have the funding identified to do 
a full reconstruction of Victoria Street. It's the goal of this study to establish a vision that can effectively accommodate bicycle and pedestrian activity now and into the future. However, it's likely that the county will be phasing these improvements um, given the, the financial constraints and just needs to do uh, a variety of other things on, on many other roads throughout the county. However, there is a desire to improve the bicycle and pedestrian environment on Victoria before there is a full reconstruct. So what that means is that it's very likely we'd be looking at um, in, in a, an initial phase doing uh, putting in a trail on, on a side of Victoria Street and then um, on that same side, putting in what we call an urban section, which just means replacing that uh, sort of the ditch uh, system that's out there for drainage now with a curb and gutter. And then when it comes time to do a full reconstruct of Victoria, the county would again reconsider uh, the need and the, you know, the, or are the resources available to put a sidewalk or trail in on that opposite side where there's not um, a, a trail at that time when that occurs. Uh, discuss our typical sections a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, Antonio, yes. This is Antonio's cue, thanks. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna turn it to, in, over to Antonio Rosell who will bring us through these cross sections. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to chat with you again. Uh, I was part of uh, the open houses that we had uh, uh, several months ago. Um, my name is Antonio Rosell. I'm a civil engineer and an urban planner. I work for a firm called Community Design Group, and we are excited to be partners with uh, WSB in developing this project for Ramsey County. Uh, what I'm going to talk with you about tonight is a little bit of the different cross sections that we have uh, been developing over these last few months, responding to the comments that we received uh, in the first set of open houses as well, and figuring out how to really incorporate this all ages, all abilities framework that is so important for the work of Ramsey County and for the cities, for Roseville and Shoreview, as uh, we try to do, uh, uh, set up a system that works for everyone. So um, the sections that I'm about to show you uh, are a variety of sections that include a number of different elements for walking, for bicycling, for, for driving. And they include elements as well, like for example, uh, uh, what are called clear zones between driving lanes and uh, ages of pavement, uh, boulevard, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the ones, uh, as I show you these sections, you will notice that they have elements on both sides uh, of the roadway. And as, uh, as Mary mentioned, uh, it is likely that as they get developed, they're going to be done one side at a time. So you wouldn't see an implementation that includes the full cross section, but this is just uh, maybe the end state. Um, so um, uh, the, the first, the place to start is uh, with what we have today, right? So we have a rural cross section, and that means basically that you have uh, a ditch on either side of the roadway of Victoria as you do today. Um, uh, and for some reason, my screen just went up one. Let me, please forgive me. Uh, something just happened here. Okay, there we go. That's, uh, uh, so uh, this rural cross section, um, uh, Right now, it's, it doesn't match the current standards that exist in the state of Minnesota for how a rural cross-section is developed. So uh, as we do the work to upgrade, if we were to keep our rural cross-section uh, and also include pedestrian and bicycle components, it would be, uh, you see that 102 foot distance. That's how much space it would take up. Uh, you may remember this in, uh, from slide number three, uh, Mary uh, went over this number, uh, and this is the existing right-of-way, the existing available space that uh, the, the county can, can access uh, is actually, it ranges from 62 feet to 84 feet. So that's the amount of available right-of-way that doesn't require uh, uh, acquiring anybody's property to develop a roadway, uh, 62 to 84 feet. And you can see here that this is 102 feet 
So it is wider than that. And, and this cross section would not actually fit in the existing right of way. So, um, you know, it's another reason uh, why working with a, what is called an urban section, which is not a, uh, with a ditch, but has a, a curb and a gutter, uh, it takes up less space and would fit and would be up to today's standards um, um, uh, within a much more limited space. So uh, hold on in, in your mind to that, uh, to that range of numbers, 62 to 84 feet for right of way. Because what we've done is that we uh, are actually uh, uh, using a maximum number for our cross sections of 60 feet to make sure that uh, you know, anywhere along the corridor, our potential section is going to work. And so this is as a, within 60 feet, this is one potential configuration. Uh, you have uh, uh, a shared use path on the left side. So a trail for people walking and biking on the left side, a 10 foot wide path. You have uh, a planted uh, uh, boulevard, and then you have uh, driving lanes, two driving lanes. So one lane each direction, same as today. One of the things that we, we are proposing in our cross section is to narrow the lanes uh, to still a safe and usable width, but to narrow them from their present configuration so that uh, we calm the motor vehicle traffic there a little bit. So without reducing this uh, or placing different speed limit signs, but just through the design of the roadway to actually calm traffic so that it's more uh, compatible with uh, uh, the context and of the neighborhood. Um, and then on the right side, as you can see, there is a sidewalk. So that's one, one cross section. Um, uh, another uh, cross section uh, that uh, we, oh, and I should say here below, uh, below the screen, um, you see that recommended dimension and that's the range of widths that would be typical or would be recommended. So you can see underneath the shared use path, eight to 10 feet uh, with 10 foot being the preferred dimension, uh, eight foot being the minimal ac acceptable. For a planted boulevard, uh, minimum of six feet. This is in, the, in this yellow, light yellow uh, strip in the, in the bottom of the screen. And these dimensions will be consistent throughout the other, the other uh, cross sections. You want a minimum of six foot uh, a boulevard because it serves two purposes. First, if you're gonna plant a tree, that's the minimum space that a tree needs to be healthy. And you also benefit from having that width because you can, during the winter time, uh, as you plow a street, that's where you would store snow and it wouldn't get on the trail or the sidewalk that you may have on the other side. So you want a six foot is a, a, a good standard minimal dimension for that. Then you see a curb reaction distance, which is a distance between the driving lane and the, and the curb. Um, and then on the other side, on the right side of the, of the screen, where you see the lady walking, uh, you have a six foot sidewalk. The very minimum uh, distance for, or, or dimension for a sidewalk is uh, five foot, uh, but this, uh, a six foot sidewalk is really uh, what's recommended if you uh, want to have a comfortable space for walking and for uh, wheelchairs to transit as well. Um, uh, here's another cross section, which is basically uh, flipping, uh, uh, that design so that rather than having uh, the shared use path on the left side of your screen, now it's on the right side and the sidewalk is up. So, but the dimensions are the same. So, but this is, uh, and the reason why uh, we're studying, you know, uh, having it on the west side versus the east side of Victoria is for some really important considerations regarding uh, the ease with which children can access the schools in the area, for example. Uh, so, you know, if, if the trail, if a trail is provided and it's only provided on the eastern side, uh, children who live um, west of Victoria need to cross Victoria itself to get on the trail, uh, arrive to the school, and then cross Victoria again, where if we provide the trail on the west side of Victoria, uh, the, the need for them, for those children to cross uh, Victoria, you know, that's no longer needed. Now, uh, for children who live on the east side of Victoria, there is already, as you know, um, a, a facility on, on West Owasso Boulevard. And so there is some redundancy on the eastern side uh, that doesn't exist on the western side today. So um, those were some of the thoughts as we were thinking, well, east side or west side, let's Let's make sure that we have designs that address both. Um, and then of course, the, 
uh, you know, uh, the option that works for everybody and, and really reduces uh, the number of potential crossings is, well, what if we just provide a trail on, on both sides? So a shared use path on the east side, shared use path on the west side. What are the cost implications for that? How does it work? Does it take up more space? Now you can see that, uh, you know, still looking at that dimension line on the top of the drawing, 60 foot. So you can accommodate a trail on one side and a sidewalk on the other, or you can accommodate a, a, a full width 10 foot trail on both sides of Victoria and still work within that 60 foot uh, limit. And you, and you may notice that you, we actually have about six foot uh, left over in terms of right of way. So this cross section is a 54 foot cross section uh, right now. And of course there'll be variability, but so this tells us that we could deploy this throughout the corridor you know, if the funding and the timing and all of that uh, were to arrive, but we're just looking at uh, what is what is pot potential, what is possible. Now, we also looked at, uh, uh, you know, you might ask, well, does this happen that a trail gets developed on one side and not on the other? Well, yes, it, 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 it does quite often, uh, you know, in many places in Roseville and in Shoreview, uh, like for example here, uh, uh, you can see this example of a trail on, 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 on white sides right along Victoria as well. Um, now, another set of concepts that we wanted to discuss and explore was the idea of what is called a protected bicycle lane or a separated bicycle lane, uh, which is it's a type of bicycle lane, but it's, it's very different from the bicycle lanes that we are uh, most accustomed to because they are not uh, you know, the, the standard bicycle lane is placed right next to the moving cars. And the only thing that separates you from the moving car is a little stripe of paint on the roadway, right? Uh, so a separated or protected bicycle lane is actually physically separated from uh, the moving motor vehicles. And in this case, you know, let's look at the drawing a little bit. And starting from the, from the left side of the screen, you can see there is a sidewalk, a six foot sidewalk. And then there is a bicycle lane with one directional travel towards us, a five foot sidewalk. Then there's a boulevard uh, and then there's the driving lane. And so uh, the bicycle lane is not on the roadway. The bicycle lane is at the elevation of the sidewalk and next to the sidewalk and it's separated from cars by the six foot boulevard. So quite a distance, it's uh, very similar to a trail. Um, uh, there are some reasons why you would use a separated bicycle uh, facility versus a shared use path. For example, if you are in a commercial district in a city where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic and there's also a number of bicyclists uh, riding to and from, you probably don't want to have a shared use path facility there because you don't want to mix people walking with people bicycling. Uh, in the same, if there is high enough numbers of them, that becomes an issue as well. So a, a separated facility, um, you know, a, 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 that has a, a specific space for bicycles and a specific space for walking, and that those are separate from each other, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense in a place like that because it's a safety issue uh, for people walking as, as, uh, and for people biking as well. And so anyway, with this facility here that, that uh, I'm showing on your screen, um, you know, the, the, the same configuration is uh, uh, copied over to the right side of the screen. So you have a five foot, you know, you have the six foot uh, planted boulevard, a five foot bicycle lane and uh, a six foot sidewalk. Now you might notice if you're really paying attention and looking really closely that the bicyclists uh, are going in two different directions. And, you know, they're following the directions of the flow of traffic. Uh, and it's a one-way facility generally, unless you have you know, much more space. Uh, uh, but generally in a bicycle, in a protected bicycle lane situation, you generally want to have, um, you know, in each, you, have, you, want, you want to have a dedicated space for each direction of travel, especially because as I mentioned just a couple of moments ago, uh, in a place like a commercial district or a downtown district or a main street, uh, you know, you, you do want to have that predictable flow uh, uh, so that pedestrians know where and, and what direction to expect the bicyclists from, uh, and also uh, to simplify some of your intersection movements. Here's a, 
another version of a, uh, of a separated bicycle lane. This is a second option. And the difference between this, this option and the one that I just showed you is the location of the bicycle facility. So starting all the way from the uh, left side of the screen again, uh, we have the sidewalk, uh, the person walking there, a six foot sidewalk. Um, here, we're showing uh, what is a five foot um, uh, 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 boulevard uh, with the idea that some of the, 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 the root mass from the tree can go in under the, uh, both under the bicycle lane and under the sidewalk. Uh, but then you see the, the bicyclist uh, is still separated now by a two foot uh, curb um, from the, the travel lane, but uh, and, and at the elevation of the sidewalk, I should also say, um, uh, but still, you know, that might, this configuration might lead into some issues with snow storage, for example, as, you know, snow plow operations, et cetera. But anyway, this, this uh, uh, you know, so we looked at, at, at this and during the first set of open houses, actually in the in-person open houses, we received a number of comments saying, are you guys looking at, you know, we'd like to take a look at, at, at protected bicycle lanes. And so we, we thought that it would be important to come back to you today and and have some information related to those as well. Um, and let's see, uh, here's an example from Edina of uh, a facility of, of the, birth, the, the first, uh, uh, you know, that, that matches the, the first facility that I, sh that I showed you when we were talking about separated bicycling. So you can see the sidewalk uh, uh, all the way on the left side and then the, the one direction uh, bicycle lane coming towards it at the same elevation as the sidewalk, then the planted boulevard, and then uh, the roadway as well. So with that, I think I am going to now turn this uh, presentation back to Mary. And I, uh, you know, of course, if you have any questions or need any more information, type them in the Q&A. We're going to get through all the questions as best as we can tonight, and all of the answers will be available on the website. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Antonio. All right, so um, the, what we then did after, with all of the, the cross-section concepts that Antonio um, and our, our TAC came up with was, uh, was screen them. And uh, we did this at a fairly high level and some of the, the questions we were trying to answer, well, I, excuse me, let me back up a step. So one thing we were trying to figure out how well all of these concepts avoid my, major right-of-way impacts, how well do they fit into their, the context of the location? So this, we're in Roseville and Shoreview, which are pretty well built out suburban communities. So do, do these, all these concepts that we came up with fit within that concept? And also, do they meet the needs of all users so that all users, all ages and abilities? So what we did is come up with a screening process to answer these questions. And I, just before we get started, one thing that we realized is that all of these concepts do, whether or not they work ultimately or not, they would all improve the safety of walking and biking on Victoria Street. They all would meet those state aid design standards, which are um, the, the designation of the road um, means that uh, we have to meet certain MnDOT de designated design standards. And also from what we can tell at this point, it doesn't seem that any of these concepts would result in anything that could not be mitigated from a social environment or an economic impact. So that being said, we just, we came up with a screening process, as I mentioned. So um, just to sort of orient folks on, um, on how this is set up, we have the, uh, the type. So we have that one rural concept with the ditches that Antonio went over um, with a trail on one side and then a possibly a sidewalk or something on the other. And then we go into those more urban concepts with the, the curb and the gutter and we, you know, we have the trail on the west and possible sidewalk on the east and then vice versa, trail on both sides and then those um, cycle track options. And then the criteria that we looked at were how well these, all of these concepts would avoid major right-of-way impacts. And I, I will note that um, all concepts are likely when they're built, if, you know, when, if and when they're built, would, are likely to require some temporary construction easements and possibly some minor permanent right-of-way acquisition. Um, 
so that is, you know, we can't say at this point that something is going to result in absolutely nothing, but we were trying to look at that at that higher level. Um, we also, you know, looked at the existed the consistency with the existing concept context, um, how well uh, a concept would meet the needs of all people potentially using the corridor. Uh, phasing, is phasing possible? That was that, um, you know, could we build something on one side to meet those immediate needs? And then when the county was ready to reconstruct the entire corridor, we mentioned early on that they would consider doing something on the other side. Would that be possible? Um, and then if it would be possible, would it still be possible to connect to those key destinations on um, the west side of Victoria Street? So I just wanted to touch on those, um, and Antonio touched on this as well, but there are um, what we discovered as we were doing the existing conditions, documenting existing conditions for this, is that there are a lot, it seems that there's a higher concentration of things on the west side of Victoria that uh, bicyclists and pedestrians would be likely to you know, travel to on, on bike or foot, um, that being elementary schools just outside of the, oops, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself, just outside of the corridor, we have Island Lake and St. Odelia schools, and then, um, you know, pretty, just not too far off the corridor too, just um, on County Road D, we have the Emma D. Williams School, um, there's also a Montessori school nearby there. Um, but there are then sidewalks on County Road D as well. Um, down in the south part of the corridor, there is um, Owasso ball fields, and then uh, just all those connections to um, Central Park across uh, County Road C to the south of County Road C. And then uh, it, Antonio also mentioned that, um, you know, there is a possible, for at least part of the corridor, you know, it is possible for uh, residents on the east side of Victoria Street to use that trail on West Owasso Boulevard as well. So with that said, this is that completed screening chart. So um, I won't spend lots of time, as we mentioned, this will be available on the, uh, on the project webpage, on the study webpage um, in a day or two. Um, so for, we'll just quickly go through some of those that kind of got phased out as part of the screening process. So starting off with that rural cross section, so with the, um, where we would keep that, uh, those ditches, that kind of an environment, but as Antonio mentioned during his, his um, slides, that ditch does not meet current engineering standards. And as a result, we'd have to go to a much wider footprint. So that, you know, from, we would need quite a bit more footprint in order to do that. So that would result in considerably more um, right of way needed and of course more costs. And then, um, you know, the phasing, would it be possible to do a trail on both sides? It, or, you know, would it be possible to connect to those things on the West? And it just depends on what, what side you built that trail on first. Um, the trail on the west side seems to meet quick all those boxes, yes. So it, avoiding major right-of-way impacts, consistency with context, et cetera. Uh, the trail on the east is pretty, performs pretty well as also with the exception of meeting those key destinations on the west side. It would, you know, it certainly would be great to have it out there versus nothing, but it would still, um, you know, require people to cross to those destinations on the other side. Trail on both sides, again, that um, is kind of, I guess, the same as a trail on the east or west. And then, can, you know, during the next phase, considering um, whether or not something else should be built. So that's, um, that's not too far off of either the trail on the east or the trail on the west. And the, so then moving on to the cycle track, um, so for both of those options that we looked at that Antonio shared, um, this is kind of where these, these concepts do fall out of, um, it very likely fall out from us carrying them further in the study. They, they avoid permanent right-of-way impacts. However, they really are not um, fitting that, the context, that suburban context. They are more, um, I guess typical and maybe fit the, the context of a more urban um, neighborhood or environment better. 
Um, also, because they are directional, um, they would not meet the needs and abilities of all people. Um, and then is phasing possible? And the answer is no. I mean, it wouldn't make much sense to build a, a bike trail that you can only go north or south on. So I don't think many people would think that makes much sense. So um, for those reasons, you, you know, it's likely that that cycle track option is probably not going to be the best fit. So where we landed is um, say, thinking that, and uh, this is something we certainly want feedback on, is the cross sections that remain and um, should be carried forward for additional you know, development and screening is the a trail on the west side or a trail on the east side. And this is, this is again, reflecting that phase one um, where the county and cities would work together to put in this trail and then um, curve and gutter on one side. And then um, when it comes time for full reconstruction, consider what would need to be done on um, if it makes sense to do something on the other side. Um, I also did want to point out that we did take a look at intersections. And this is important, uh, especially if there is a trail on just one side of Victoria Street those crossing locations are going to be important. Um, you know, if people are crossing to use the trail or crossing to, uh, you know, access a destination, we want to make sure that they're doing it um, safely. So in total, there are 12 intersections on, on Victoria Street within the study area. So we took a look at a number of things at each of those, each of those locations. So um, again, using this matrix, um, we have all the intersections listed. And then we looked at things like the number of um, lanes that people had to cross. Um, this one is fairly straightforward in that the only one that had multiple, more than two lanes to cross is County Road C, and that's uh, down at the south end um, of, you know, at Victoria Street. Uh, at, so safety is another thing we looked at. Does it have a crash rate that's higher than average? And yes, a number of those intersections do. So Arbor Gas, County D, County C2, and then again, County C. A um, number of these intersections have intersecting pedestrian facilities and bicycle facilities. Um, and then one of them, so it has what's called an uh, existing pedestrian countermeasure. So that just means this is at County Road D, which again is very close to Emmett D. Williams, and it does have that marked crosswalk as well as those pedestrian uh, crossing signs at that intersection. There are also a number of those intersections have, uh, you know, transit access. People are possibly crossing those intersections or, or waiting for buses at those intersections. And then just access to destinations. Is it on a, on the way to something like a school or a park or a trail? So um, I should mention too that um, we are county road sees in a little bit that kind of rises to the top in terms of meeting the most of having the most of those boxes checked. However, the county has separately completed another study on county road C specifically to convert that road from a four to three lanes. So Victoria Street, this particular study won't be looking at any kind of, uh, you know, that, that this intersection is going to be handled by another study. So where we came up was, um, you know, some of those intersections that rise to the top are Arborgast, um, County Road D, uh, West Owasso Boulevard, which, you know, in addition to those things on that screening table also have a tricky hill and a curve right there. So that one is definitely um, something that needs a closer look at some point in the future. And then Wood Hill Drive. And so what this is useful for, this particular study isn't going to come up with the solutions for necessarily what to do with at each of those intersections. However, uh, when the county and the cities are deciding that it's time to put that trail and that urban cross section in during that uh, phase one, this tells um, you know th this tells them also that hey, let's look and see what we can do at some of these intersections to improve the safety and how well um, people will be able to cross them. And these are just a couple of images of 
some of these intersections. So the, I mentioned those, uh, the pedestrian countermeasures, these are those signs. And then you can see the uh, crosswalk and then um, a, a bus stop as well. And then West Owasso Boulevard, which of course is, um, I think very kind of infamous on this corridor for having that hill and the curve and um, just a lot going on at that intersection. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Matt Greenslet, who um, came up with these uh, the plan view concepts for the west, a trail on the west and a trail on the east side of Victoria Street. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, so what we ended up doing was taking those um, two concepts and um, putting them in a plan view um, view so that we could kind of identify um, some of the possible issues or concerns and uh, illustrate where that proposed trail would would go. Um, we kind of looked at some geometric issues from a roadway standpoint and um, identified, like Mary previously talked about, some of those intersections that could be a little bit trickier and then uh, looked at some of the existing and proposed crossings. Um, and we also, you'll see, we illustrated the, um, the existing trails and existing sidewalk as well. So this first concept has the trail on the west side um, and starting at the south at County Road C, um, there is some existing sidewalk there, which um, if the trail was to go on this side would be removed and replaced with, with the, a little bit wider trail. So it wouldn't be dual at this point, but we would replace one with the other. Um, um, the second sheet here is just kind of continuing to the north. Um, uh, continuing the. Do they go too fast? Sorry. I, yeah, no, sorry. That's okay. So this one, we just uh, continue with that trail on the, on the west side and just kind of the notes. So this ends up being um, just a general location. So we hadn't looked at um, exact geometry, exact location of the, where the trail will go. So if it looks like the trail might be going over part of your property or uh, impacting something that, you know, might not be ideal. This, this is just more of a general layout and kind of those next phases would identify um, more detail. So um, this one just continues with it on the west side, um, identifies a couple of existing crossings that um, potentially would remain. And then I guess, Mary, you could go on to the next one. So as we continue here, um, same thing, we look at potentially adding, um, you know, pedestrian uh, crossings at the side streets. Um, County Road C, C2 would be kind of classified as one of those intersections where there's uh, above average crashes where we might uh, look at some sort of improvement there. Good, no, yep, and then, here we get a it gets a um, little bit more tricky as we as we come into that that next road here uh, the curve does uh, get a little bit sharp um, we've also identified this as a potential location where pedestrians might like to cross just with the existing trail on the east side of the road and then um, we've also considered uh, Millwood as a possible location to cross just as a a little better possibility with it, better sight lines. And then an additional, the vertical curve would be something if we were to do the full build some someday down the road that that would be a possible area um, to improve. Yep, and then this one tends to be pretty straightforward. We just continue with the trail on the west side with uh, potential um, crossing improvements side street. Um, here um, we get to County Road D and we kind of identified this as um, an intersection that did have above average crash rates but also as a possible location where pedestrians would like to cross with with the school and activities to the west side of Victoria. So 
another location where we potentially look at improvements. Um, and then as we continue to the to the north, we're just another curve where uh, sight lines can be a little tricky. Um, so possible improvements from a roadway standpoint, which would also help out the trail um, as, as that full build potentially would come into play. Um, this one tends to be pretty straightforward again, just uh, potential pedestrian improvements at the side streets. Um, here we, we continue with the trail on the west side and we've, we've identis, identified, excuse me, this, this intersection as another um, possible location where we look at uh, where we might see a little bit higher level of crossing of Victoria, um, especially with the existing trail on the, on the east side of Victoria. So trying to find a way to connect, connect up to that existing trail and um, potential for some improvements. And then the trail, as far as our current study goes, would, would edit Cannon Avenue. I'm not sure how much, um, so these are essentially the same with the trail on the other side. So I'm not yeah. sure how much, these, I should mention, these will all be available on the, the study website and over the next couple of days, I would say for sure by early next week, and that you'll have the opportunity to uh, look at each of these slides and provide comments um, on, on the map um, on the, that's gonna be available on the, the study website as well. So um, let's see here. Yeah, so ultimately um, most of what I just went over applies to these uh, these sheets as well and slides as well. So Mary will probably just go through them a yeah. little faster, but yep. um, similar, uh, similar roadway concerns, similar locations for crossing just because of the uh, activities and school locations. So And we can certainly address uh, specific comments on any of these slides um, during the Q&A and bring them back up if people have specific questions. Um, but for now, I think we'll just uh, move on and wrap up this, uh, the presentation part of this, uh, of this meeting. So uh, I just wanna mention that some of the next steps that we have are, uh, we wanna come up with recommended uh, cross sections to carry forward, we're kind of, gotten to the point where we, um, the study team believes that looking at those, um, a trail on the east and a trail on the west as um, a project right now make the most sense to get of all the cross sections that we've considered. Uh, so uh, we're obviously going to get through this public involvement process and hear what um, the folks in the who use and live in the neighborhood think about that, um, see if there are other, other thoughts. Um, well, and then depending on that, we'll develop alignments based on um, those recommended cross sections. And again, do further evaluation. We'll identify how well, again, these alternatives meet um, and address problems and needs. Um, and then also, uh, because as Matt mentioned, we'll be doing a little more, more than just a line on a map. We'll actually be looking at how a trail would, you know, fit into the real world and see what kind of, um, social, economic, and environmental impacts might be, um, might be the result of some of these um, concepts. We'll have a, another opportunity for an open house. Um, let's see, we're in April, I would guess sometime uh, this summer, and finalize the recommendation and uh, complete this study. And with that, we're done with the presentation portion. I think we're, we're ready to move into the question and answer section. So um, I believe Scott, you wanted to uh, facilitate this part of the meeting. Yeah, thank you, Mary. And thank you to the consultant team for running through all of that information for us. Um, yeah, so there are some people that provided some questions uh, with the Q&A function. And I would encourage you to continue to do that if you have thoughts that are developing as we continue to have this conversation. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go through the questions that have been developed 
so far and then we'll call on you know some of our staff or consultant team um, or uh, city staff to uh, to help us provide answers to these questions. Uh, the first question has to do with um, would it be possible to um, put up no parking signs at certain locations along the corridor? Um, I guess, uh, you know, that really is sort of an operations uh, issue that would uh, be a decision primarily of um, both cities uh, in cooperation with the county since it's a Ramsey County roadway. Uh, the, the question was asked because um, certain times there's vehicles that are parked on the shoulder and when people are biking or walking on the shoulder then that creates a conflict and those people have to go into the driving lane to go around the vehicle. Um, so obviously if we construct a trail at some point in the future then hopefully you know it's our intent that those people that are currently using the shoulder will use the separated trail instead of being on the shoulder. So parking on the shoulder would not be as big of a concern, but we can certainly make a note of this uh, and talk offline with both cities to see what their thoughts are in the interim before a trail is constructed, um, what, their what their thoughts are as to the feasibility of putting up no parking signs. Um, the second question, um, has to do with a shared use path and why, if there was a shared use path, why um, a dedicated sidewalk would also be required. Um, you know, that I, I don't think that it's necessarily a requirement that you have a sidewalk and a shared use path. I think, um, you know, like Mary mentioned at the start of the presentation, uh, because of funding shortfalls, uh, the county would work with both cities to phase the project and initially we would build a trail on either the east side of the road or the west side of the road. Um, so that would be the initial step. And then at some point in the future, when the roadway is fully reconstructed, we would uh, work with both, both cities to determine if there's funds available and a need to build a sidewalk or a trail on the opposite side of the roadway. Um, there's also a question about, uh, I think this ties to Mary's um, information about um, the intersection analysis. And there's a question about if, if single vehicle crashes were analyzed as part of the intersection analysis. I don't know if Mary, if you're able to address that. Um, I, I think the only way that we, if it was something that was reported uh, to the police and was, in, you know, it was in the database, the crash database that we used, we counted it. Uh, I know that for when we had the first open house and talking to people who live uh, in that area of, of West Owasso Boulevard, that there are a lot of unreported crashes that happen there, just people crashing into mailboxes or into lawns and that kind of thing. So those have, those are not captured in the and the accounts that we have just because it's not, it has a lot of them aren't reported. So we don't know about them, but other than anecdotally. Sure, thank you, Mary. Um, there's also a question about, uh, did the trail concepts um, consider narrowing of the existing driving lanes? And if that, um, if the driving lanes were narrowed would that uh, reduce speed? Um, I'm gonna maybe start to answer this and maybe ask Antonio to elaborate. Um, so as I mentioned just a little bit ago, um, the plan that the county has for this corridor is that we would initially build a trail on one side of the road or the other. So um, for that initial phase, there would not be a narrowing of lanes because we would just be constructing the trail with the urban section, curb and gutter. Um, and I'll let Antonio address the other part of the question as it relates to as part of a full build out of the corridor, if it was anticipated that lanes may potentially be reduced. Right. Uh, thank you, Scott. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, that question. So uh, something that a lot of people uh, don't know, if I were to ask you, how wide is a travel lane 
in an in I-94 or in I-35 or uh, any of the freeways? And the answer is it's a 12 foot travel lane. And that's a standard width for travel lanes in freeways all across the nation. Um, it's also unfortunately a width that is used in very many uh, of the roadways in our communities and through our communities. Uh, the current roadway along Victoria Street, the width of the travel lanes there are also 12 foot. And what a lot of communities have found is that that width, uh, in a way, in the same way that it's comfortable to drive fast uh, along the freeway, it makes it comfortable to drive fast uh, inside our communities and it causes a lot of uh, hazard. And so one of the things that uh, innovative uh, agencies like Ramsey County and Hennepin County, City of Minneapolis, City of St. Paul, uh, uh, Roseville, uh, Shoreview, a lot of what they are doing is when the opportunity comes to make a more uh, reasonable width dimension for a roadway, they do do it. Now, in this case, what we're proposing for the width of the final design concept is 10 foot travel lanes for roadways, which are uh, legal, safe, and actually happen to occur in a lot of other places in our region and, and in the country. And so, yes, we would be narrowing travel lanes uh, significantly uh, from 12 foot to 10 foot. Now, the width of a motor vehicle, generally six foot, six and a half foot uh, wide, uh, width of a bus about, um, you know, nine and a half plus mirrors. Uh, but for the kind of traffic that we would see here, and, uh, the, you know, that's the width of the lane and then also the width of the curb reaction distance, which is the distance between the lane and where the curb begins. That's another foot. Uh, foot and a half or two feet, uh, depending, but the range is one to two feet. So uh, what we'll be doing is, yes, we will be decreasing the width of the travel lanes. And what we also would be uh, doing is not, even without, without uh, changing the number that shows up in your speed limit sign, uh, the expected uh, behavior, what is expected to occur is that traffic speeds will decrease because the roadway is no longer designed to be inviting a faster travel speed and drivers will adjust uh, to that context and will drive more slowly. So that's, it's a traffic calming strategy that is used in a lot of places. There's a lot of tons of experience with it. Uh, and so that, that's part of what these concepts include, traffic calming uh, for, your, for your community. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, the next question uh, is asking about the 60 foot approximate or 60 to 80 um, foot right away width that somewhat varies along the corridor. And if that has been examined as it relates to potential specific property impacts. And the answer to that is we have not gotten to that stage of the project yet. Now that's obviously a very important aspect of the project. Uh, prior to construction, there's something called a final design that is developed that actually surveys to within less than a, uh, an inch of accuracy. It gets very specific and identifies exactly where the trail is going to go and the elevation of the trail. Um, and we're, and when we do that, we can tell exactly. Um, what impacts there would be to the adjacent properties. But we, we have not gotten to that phase of the project yet, but that is a good, a good question and something that we will provide information on later on in the process as it's available. Um, and uh, there's a couple questions here about, um, there's some uh, concern about impact to trees and uh, my answer that I just gave about, you know, future information during the uh, final design process prior to construction will help us understand uh, any impacts to trees, driveways, or any other uh, um, property impacts. Um, there's also uh, a question about, uh, a couple questions about 
who is responsible for snow clearing on the trails. And uh, so Ramsey County has uh, an arrangement uh, with all of our cities that when trails are constructed uh, along county roads that the, uh, the city that the trail is in, whether that's Roseville or Shoreview or whatever the community may be, um, is responsible for uh, maintaining those trails um, and keeping them free of uh, ice and snow. Um, there's a question about um, how the drainage um, would work through the project and uh, asking if the curb and gutter design would mean that there would be a sewer underground. And um, so the answer to that is that yeah, there would be an underground drainage system when this uh, curb and gutter is installed. So that would replace the current ditch where the water just naturally drains in the ditch area uh, with a kind of an open drainage system uh, with the curb and gutter or the urban section as it's called, that water would be funneled into the storm drain with pipes and uh, directed to the proper lo location uh, through, through that process. Um, there's a question about, does the plan for a trail or sidewalk connect complete completely to Central Park. Um, and I guess for that, I would hand it off to the consultant team if somebody could address that. Um, Antonio, do you have thoughts on that? I, at this point, the limits for our study go from, uh, you know, just down to County Road C. Um, and so we don't have plans to do anything to the south, although, I, you know, you'd be able to access that sidewalk on the south side of County Road C. And then the question about why not to Island Lake School, again, we go as far as Cannon Avenue. Um, I know on our team, we have been asking some questions. I think that's something we need to take a look at maybe is um, that there, there is a trail on the other side. I think we didn't initially include um, going up to those schools because there's a trail on the east side um, of Victoria Street um, adjacent, I guess on the other side of uh, across the road from Victoria, excuse me, across the road from Island Lake and St. Odelia, which is why it wasn't included. But um, yeah, I think that's a good question. Antonio, any thoughts? Uh, you know, my, uh, so one of the things that we've been discussing uh, in kind of the, the way that the stages that this project goes is that the first thing was to figure out, you know, within the project limits that uh, Ramsey County set, that we would figure out within those limits, what are the cross sections that could work to have an all ages and abilities link. And as this kind of a concept development phase continues and completes that the actual limits for how this corridor connects to specific locations that are not directly on Victoria, but are really close by and would be really key to connect, that that would be kind of the next uh, phase of work. And I, I see Mark has his hand up, so I wanna. Uh, you know, and just, just very quickly on that, you know, south of County Road C, there does exist some, uh, some decent infrastructure. It's not to say that we wouldn't take a look at, uh, particularly if we have, you know, a really defined um, cycle track or, you know, some wider uh, trail facility that we wouldn't look at maybe widening some existing uh, pathway south of Conroe Sea, but there is there is a sidewalk south of Sea which eventually transitions into a trail. There is a um, actually a brand new, relatively new within the last year, um, cross uh, flasher um, the um, uh, rapid beacon uh, RRFB rapid rectangular flashing beacon uh, uh, flasher you know that allows you to cross Victoria. And there are trail connections for both the west side, Central Park west of Victoria and Central Park east of Victoria. 
um, that will connect people to the linear trails all through Central Park. Um, so that all exists today. This would be a wonderful connection to that. And like I said, if we were to build something north of County Road C that was wider, you know, we would definitely take a look at, you know, do we need to widen some pieces of the trail uh, south of C to, to make it more contiguous through that area. Thank you, Mark, for that. Um, and there's also a, just a, more of a comment here, not really a question, but just um, wanting everybody to understand, I guess, from this person's perspective that Victoria Street tends to be a big draw for leisure and commuter bicyc bicyclists who want a through north-south corridor. Um, so just wanting to kind of make a note of that, that this is kind of a through uh, thoroughfare for some bikers uh, that um, looking at to make those longer trips. Um, there's also a question here about would curb and gutter be installed on both sides of the road? Again, initially the project would be phased. So there would be curb and gutter on whatever side of the road we decide to construct the trail on. At some point in time in the future when the road is fully reconstructed, there would be curb and gutter on the opposite side of the roadway. Uh, those are all of the questions that I have for now. I'll just oh, sort of pause for a second. More, okay, there's a couple more coming in. Yeah, I and going back to that one about the um, leisure commuter bicyclists, there was a question embedded in there. Uh, asking if we looked at a cross-section option where a wider shoulder, a wider off-street shoulder and a more standard sidewalk or trail on each side was considered. And, um, Antonio, I, Antonio, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, how that, I know sure, uh, we were trying to keep everything into the, within that 60 feet. Uh, yes, so this is one of those uh, situations where you know we have to fit everything that you want within a, a limited space and because of our constraint of the 60 foot um, and uh, you know as Scott said you know we haven't gone down to a survey level type of, of determination but just using the existing parcel data parcel information uh, we know that the controlling you know the the narrowest gap where we have uh, a right of way is 62 feet. And so we wanted to make sure that we were well below that for the entire corridor. And so um, trying to think about what are the goals for the project. So uh, goal number one for, you know, as a bicycle and pedestrian connection is that in that Ramsey County goal from the Ramsey County master plan of all ages, all abilities. And so that was, so these are the controlling factors, the available right of way, the 60 foot, right? Um, uh, all ages, all, all abilities, meaning have facilities where given guidance from MINDOT about, uh, uh, you know, what does all ages and abilities mean when we're talking about bicycling in a context like uh, Roseville and Shoreview in this area. Uh, that means, uh, uh, level of traffic stress one, as Mary showed at the start of our presentation. And that means facilities that are um, uh, friendly and usable uh, by young children um, and families. And so that puts us where, where we need to have, if we want to have an all ages and abilities network link, we need to have a trail facility. Um, and so then we have 60 foot, we need to have a trail. Um, we need to have also to calm traffic in the corridor. So we want to narrow the space available for cars. A wide shoulder takes up more space, uh, uh, but also because it opens up that roadway, uh, it works against the idea of calming traffic as well. And so, um, you know, trying to look at all of those different options where we landed is well, in the cross sections. That, that we've shown uh, you today, uh, including the ditch uh, cross section. Um, you know, if, you know, depending uh, as maybe follow up from this, it may be something that we want to provide just a cross section showing uh, a wider shoulder, but knowing that, uh, you know, we have limited right of way 
uh, and then that that one would work against the desire to to calm traffic uh, along this roadway as well. So it's figuring out, you know, what are the things that we, uh, the essentials that we must have uh, in the design, uh, uh, so that we can try to uh, uh, really satisfy as many of those uh, demands on the existing space. Thank you, Antonio. Um, there's a few more questions here. Um, the next question has to do with, um, could there be any consideration to add stop signs uh, or signal lights along Victoria Street to encourage traffic to use other adjacent roadways such as Lexington or Rice to reduce traffic issues? And I guess the short answer to that is that um, no, that's not being considered. Uh, there are specific engineering criteria that um, are recommended uh, to be considered when you install a stop sign uh, or a signal light. Uh, it actually can make a roadway less safe if you just um, add a stop sign or, or signal light to deter traffic on a certain, road, a certain roadway. Uh, so that's really not recommended and there isn't any consideration at this time to add any stop signs or, or signal lights along Victoria through the study area, you know, that will be revisited, um, you know, in the future as conditions warrant. Um, there's also another question here about connections to Central Park. I think Mark already addressed that. Um, uh, actually, just real quick, I, I read that and they're talking about Central Park North, which is actually in the northeast corner of C and Victoria there. And okay, there is a trail crossing there. Uh, or there's a trail that ends north of the railroad tracks that comes off of Pinell Drive. And uh, we've actually had, without spending some significant dollars on a, a rail crossing um, there, um, we can't extend that trail across the, the railroad tracks. Um, it, it's, it's not something that we've completely ruled out. It's just, it's not, it, it, it's, it's very difficult just given the cost and the complexity of trying to add a crossing to the railroad tracks and generally speaking, working with a railroad on something like that. So um, I, I can't say that it will never happen, but it, it's, it's not something that's currently budgeted or, or um, in the works. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's another question here about um, just kind of recognizing that in some other communities, um, bikers use, use the roadway instead of a trail, even though the trail is constructed and asking if anything can be done to require people to use the trail. And the answer to that is uh, we cannot require anybody to use the trail. Uh, bikers are allowed to use the roadway along with motor vehicles. So it's obviously encouraged to use the trail. It's uh, safer, but uh, for certain types of bicyclists that like to drive faster, um, that are using it for more of a commuting function, uh, sometimes people do not like to use the trail. So it's really more of that bicyclist preference and, you know, where they're most comfortable in uh, riding. Uh, there's also a question here about, are there any other uh, design treatments that can be used uh, in addition to uh, narrowing, lane, narrowing lane widths um, to uh, encourage um, slower driving speeds. Uh, there are a number of things that can be done um, along those lines. You know, I guess the point that I'll make is that, you know, this is also a county road. So there is also an expectation for mobility and for people to use uh, the, the the corridor for, uh, um, for getting from point A to point B with their vehicles. So we need to kind of balance balance those interests. And I don't know if uh, um, anybody else on the consultant team or staff uh, have anything more to add to that. Um, otherwise, I'll just move on. Um, is a comment that uh, trails are not safe for bike commuters, is what one one individual is is noting. Um, 
And those are the questions that I see right now. Uh, Mary, do you see any more coming in? No, I don't. Okay, I just see one more that just came in. Okay. Um, if the desire is to have people drive slower, can we lower the speed limit? And uh, yeah, this is a very common question that is asked. Um, um, Minnesota state statute um, provides certain uh, uh, requirements for how speed limits are set along Ramsey County roads and all county roads. And so those speeds are set by speed studies that are conducted by MnDOT. And the speed posted speed is posted at the 85th percentile um, of the speeds taken during those speed studies. So that's how speed limits are set along Ramsey County roads. And um, uh, you know that's really um, how the current process works. Um, it is getting kind of later in the evening here. So I, I think the questions have slowed down. Um, I want to also, uh, you know, thank everybody that came on the call this evening. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Fretham. I'm not sure, Commissioner, if you have any other uh, comments or parting words for everybody. Uh, everyone who showed up and to rest your questions for team been working so hard on this study, you know, it's going to take time. There were a lot of good questions asked and engaged. I will add that um, Representative Becker has proposed a change in the law that would allow Ramsey County to lower the speed limit. Um, there isn't a Senate companion, but who knows where that will end up at the end of the, the session. So watch for that. Um, we're also having a workshop on Tuesday, uh, the Board of Commissioners, and that'll you can watch it live uh, uh, on, on the internet, or you can go ahead and view it afterwards. It'll be uh, archived, and that is on speed limits across Ramsey County. So this is an issue not just on Victoria, but on several other county roads where our speeds are very um, high, considering the, the residential density along those roads. So this, this is a topic that has a lot of interest right now. So please, I, I hope you have a chance to join us for that or to watch it. Feel free to reach out to me if, if you have additional questions or need the link before or after the, the workshop. Um, otherwise, thank you for your participation. Um, as you know, this is a process and I know that our partners in Shoreview and Roseville want to be a part of this work. And, uh, uh, and that'll be the other piece of this moving forward is making sure that everyone's at the table and, and, and ready to invest and move forward. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Fretham. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we also want to thank again, like uh, Commissioner mentioned, our partners on this study, uh, Mark Culver and Tom Wesolowski uh, from the city of Shoreview in Roseville um, and our consultant team and everybody that joined us on the call this evening. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, stop with uh, the Q&A session. I see there's a couple more that are trickling in, but please know that we will respond to all questions and post the answers on the project website. You can look forward to seeing that next week along with a recording of the presentation and a PowerPoint of the presentation. And please stay in touch as we uh, continue with this study into the spring and early summer months and have a nice evening. Bye everyone, good night. Bye, thank you.